Well, let's get started. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Today we have the esteemed Australian author Rosalie Ham with us today to tell us a bit about her career and her um, hit novel, The Dressmaker, which we're actually studying in year 12 English right now. So hi, Rosalie, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your books? Thank you, Megan, I will. Um, and hello, everybody, and welcome to this Zoom. Um, I'm getting used to doing Zooms. It's a bit hard for old people to get hold of technology, but I've <laughs> made it very easy. So I'm very happy to be here. What I, I'm going to talk for a little while about the dressmaker and some of the themes. Um, I'll start off with why I wrote it and how I wrote it just briefly and then I'm going to throw it back to Megan and James and they're going to feed me some questions. Um, I'll start off by reading something I, I wrote a long time ago. <laughs> I wrote. Um, the dressmaker, in the dressmaker, costume is a primary language. It's a literary device and a vehicle to convey the themes through Tilly Dunnage and her customers. Her sewing skills allow Tilly to create couture that disguises the physical flaws of the characters. This in turn provokes their sense of vanity and is a catalyst for the dramatization of their situation, thus propelling their devastating journey through the story. So the sumptuous costumes and the desolate dun-coloured setting are juxtaposed and that provokes themes of envy, bigotry, hypocrisy, uh, bullying. And in the end, the women are ruined by their own secrets and the lie that they're living. Um, but not until the readers have enjoyed the vicarious and transformative pleasure of beautiful frocks, transformation being one of the main themes. Um, descriptions of the lush and fantastical costumes engage readers eliciting an emotional response. And that for a novelist, or for me in particular, I can't speak for all novelists, um, that is the main purpose of writing a novel in that you transport your readers to somewhere else and you create a kind of alternate rea reality where they can empathise with the characters or not and hope and dream and love and hate and do all those sorts of things along with the characters. At the same time, speaking of all those themes and the messages that you want to get, a, get across to the readers, what you're banging on about and what you're writing about or exploring or arguing is the thing that drives the narrative. And in this case, it happened to be... Uh, those themes of hypocrisy, bigotry, jealousy, envy, bullying and lies, the lie that the people of Dungatar were living, what the truth was as opposed to what people said was the truth and uh, the secrets that were all threatened that maintained the equilibrium in the town. Um, and into this, if you throw couture on that desolate, isolated landscape, all of those things, the equilibrium and the way the town ticks over is, of course, thrown into chaos through fear because the people of Dungatar live in fear of even Pettyman for um, most of the time. Now, The Dressmaker was actually my first novel. I'll say that up front. Um, so I started writing it in 1996 and I wrote it as part of a professional writing and editing course and my aim in writing that novel was to finish a novel, to, to, to make sure I could write a novel. One of the things that they told us in writing class was that you don't get your first novel published. Your first novel is about unloading my terrible childhood, the day my pet died, my mother never loved me as much as my sister or whatever it is that you've got. You know, that, that's what a lot of people uh, end up doing. They write that out and then they find they've got nothing more to say, nothing to add to the canon of Australian literature. Um, but I was a bit different. I persisted with that course and I got to the end of the course having put everything into that novel, everything that I knew from my vast travels and um, I sent it off to a publisher more as a dare than anything. And they wrote back and said they were going to publish it, which was all very exciting uh, until I realised that my mother would probably read the book in which at what, that point I, got, I started to panic, but by then it was far too late. 
so this explains a lot about the the dressmaker because it's first novel that there are far too many characters they're not there's not quite as much introspection or a psychological or emotional development as they possibly could be but i'm happy to say that that was the first of five novels now and the fifth novel which will be coming out in november is the sequel to the dressmaker and in that i explore the themes of costume as opposed to couture um, and the whole idea that you wear clothes as that primary language as a disguise and what that does and in that fifth novel what Tilly Dunnage decides to do with that talent which has been exploited and abused in Dungatar and used um, by the people of Dungatar which happily brought them all unstitched but Tilly Dunnage chooses to move on from that. Um, I'll just briefly tell you, I was born and raised in a small country town called Gerildery, and the population is 800. And it's a very flat landscape um, because there were so few people, it was very uncluttered. Because there were so few people, you knew exactly what everybody was doing all of the time. Um, you knew everybody's past, their triumphs, their tragedies, their scandals, and you knew their secrets. Uh, but you never said anything about anybody's secret because if you said something about their secret, they would say something about your secret and that would disrupt the equilibrium. And I knew that as a kid, but I also knew about the duality in that truth, that it was there was an acceptable truth and there was an unacceptable truth that was never mentioned. I was aware of that from a very young age Um I was aware that there were kids in that town that were adopted and they didn't even know they were adopted, And uh, but I knew not to say anything. It's uncluttered, that landscape. You, I, I grew up looking at a horizon over there and wondering what was beyond it and imagining what was beyond that horizon. We had no TV. I didn't get TV till I was about 11. So therefore my imagination was formed of nothing from my mind. There was no screen, there was no iPad, there was no TV, there was nothing to show me other people's pictures of characters and how things should be. Mine were all mine. And I think that with the uncluttered landscape and that space for the mind to wander uh, is probably um, a key to my somewhat rather vivid imagination. And the fact that we had to create our own fun and so I used to cut, create casts of characters and you know play with the, the the kids and we all made stuff up rather than you know be shown things on screens when when television did actually get to Gerildry it was black and white and they had this thing called the midday movie and it was through the midday movie um that I learned about costume how one Hollywood's superstar would appear one day in one costume as a good character and the next day they would be in another black and white film as a bad character and they would be dressed entirely differently. So the idea that costume was a language that could convey an inner truth or an inner message uh, was with me for, right from the beginning, as was um, the fact that my mum was the town seamstress and so people would come to her and say, I need a dress for the ball in two weeks and I need to look better than Mrs O'Brien. Um, and they, or they would come and say, I'm getting married in three weeks um, and I need a dress in a hurry and it has to be fairly loose fitting. Because in those days, being pregnant before you were married was a terrible thing and it was a secret. And so I learned to keep that secret, which is why Tilly Dunnage and the people of Dungatar are set in 1950 because up until the late 60s, it was still a sin to have a child out of wedlock, whereas now it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But when I was a kid growing up, it, it was a terrible thing. So all these things kind of filtered into my subconscious. The other thing about that small community was um, the stereotypes certain types of people and I recognised them when I travelled much later and I know now 
in my small community here in my home, in my suburb, in my street, I know the characters. There's a parking Nazi and there's a curtain twitcher. Um, and there's a little old lady that lives down the road in a warped old house that everybody keeps an eye on in case if her light doesn't go on one night, we will all think there could be something wrong with her. So I understood um, that those sorts of stereotypes united people and that people recognise them. And if you recognise a stereotype, then you have some sort of empathy with them. So the, I use stereotypes um, in The Dressmaker, but the thing is never make them predictable, um, which explains a lot about the characters um, doing things that are not expected. It was my intention to write a novel that wasn't usual, where there was a, a strong female protagonist and a strong female cast and they were not usual. That was my one of my ideas because I, I hadn't come across a novel like that and I wanted to write something a little bit different. I was familiar with the hierarchy, who was acceptable and who wasn't, what was acceptable and what wasn't and that the acceptable people at the top of the hierarchy were deemed acceptable by the other accepted people. But I also knew that all those people at the top of the hierarchy had a secret, and I knew what that secret was. Um, and in the case of Elspeth Beaumont, it was the fact that she couldn't pay her bills uh, and that she'd kept up the pretense of a marriage and successful and being well-heeled and quite sophisticated when, in fact, she wasn't at all. Um, and her stole, her moth-eaten fox fur gave that away, of course. Um, and all of these people, as I said, uh, could be brought undone or unstitched if there was a scandal um, and it upset the equilibrium and accusations would fly and people would say, well, you can't talk, but you did, and all that sort of stuff. So I knew about that. I also know that small communities are very loyal they look after you even if they don't. And my small community was no exception to that. Um, and they still are. They're very inclusive, accepting people, especially of their, the locals that, that they've grown accustomed to their idiosyncrasies. For example, Septimus Crescent, the flat earther in Dungatai, he's accepted, uh, even though he's clearly quite wrong about his beliefs, whereas Tilly Dunnage and Molly are not. Um, so you've got this little, you know, that's the basis of the story. Uh, add to, to all those characters and that isolated, um, idiosyncratic, separate culture of Dungatar. Add to that a beautiful heroine with a tragic past and you have mystery. And so then we have Tilly Dunnage, of course, and she has a talent. She's hated and vilified by the townspeople, but because they're hypocrites, they use her to their own end. Tilly didn't ever do anything. She just did exactly what they wanted her to do. The reason that she and Molly were cast out was that they were a constant reminder to Evan Pettyman, who was at the top of the hierarchy, and outwardly um, leading a respectable marriage with a lovely wife. Uh, but, of course, he wasn't. He was molesting her and drugging her of an evening, and he was also a lecherous, terrible old man. But everybody, nobody said anything. Everybody tolerated it because they lived in fear of Evan Pettyman. He, he could wield a lot of power, and if he chose to, to single out one person and destroy them, then everybody would destroy everybody else, and the relationship between Nancy and Ruth would be exposed. Mr. Almanac beating his wife would be exposed. Um, Pearl having an affair, Faith having an affair with the, with Reg Reginald, the pub staying open after six o'clock, Scotty Pullet still on the creek, and Sergeant Ferret's cross-dressing would all come tumbling down. So everybody towed the line and looked at Tilly and Mollage and said, those outsiders are wrong. She did something terrible. And by sing singling them out and accusing those two people who had done nothing wrong, really, uh, it just meant they didn't have to look at themselves and their own flaws because if they looked at their own flaws, they would have discovered that they were uh, worse than whatever T 
Tilly and Molly had had done to them. They were kind of victims. Um, so that's how the whole town kind of functioned in in that way. Um, enter into that envy on that that you know bleak landscape and you look at those beautiful costumes and I want one too I need to look better than Elspeth Beaumont all of those things entered into the equation and of course it eventually exposed all their um, flaws and the nasty people physically they look beautiful but it was a lie because it was just exacerbating envy um, jealousy, one-upmanship, bullying, all those sorts of things because there was a lot at stake and it was all to do with vanity. That's what it was. Okay, now, because I had a beautiful hero with a tragic past, of course, I needed a beautiful hero. Um, and he needed to save Tilly, and he did. Tragically, he died in the process. So when the town rejected Tilly and Teddy and their relationship and when they rejected them from the ball because Evan Pettyman saw her and she was a reminder that his upstandingness was under threat, there was his biggest mistake, so he thought, and also she had the nerve to steal their star full forward and, and turn up at the ball looking much better than them and the bell of the ball was at stake. So they were rejected and they went to the silo and it was under the stars where the conversation basically went I'd like to marry you. No, you can't marry me. I am cursed. You are not cursed. Yes, I am. No, you are not. I will prove it to you. I will jump and nothing will happen to me. And she said, no, don't. Don't. And he did. And he died. And that was one of the first things that proved to her or indicated to Tilly that perhaps it wasn't her, perhaps that there were people that were responsible for their own actions and just awful stuff happened it wasn't actually her of course the next thing that convinced her that the people of Dungatar were horrible was when Molly died um, seemingly suddenly becoming lucid uh, after after months and months of um, nutrition and hydration and tender loving care and the return of her long lost daughter um, Molly kind of stayed nuts to try and repel Tilly, so she wouldn't end up like Molly. But they ended up like each other, up on that hill, isolated, ostracised, bullied, again, because of the death of the star full forward. But it was the fault of the people of Dungatar. If they'd been accepting, they would have still had Stuart and they would have had their star full forward. Um, so when Molly fell or let herself fall and died, then Tilly was released um, she was still penniless. She still couldn't actually go anywhere, really. But that is when she looked at the people of the town and went, right, you lot. And uh, as I said, she didn't have to do anything. They wanted to win the Stenford. All she did was exactly what she wanted them to do. And she sat in the back of that hall and she watched them fighting at the play. And she knew, I suppose, that her plan was working. And it did work. Um, when Molly died, Sergeant Ferret emerged as his true self. Instead of being cautious and protective of his secret, he emerged um, and was his true self. But by then it was a little bit too late for Sergeant Ferret. Um, but at least he came out in the end as his true self, so that's good. I don't really think I've got a lot to say um, the setting gothic stark it's just kind of another language with with costume like um, in the way that costume means you can blend in in have a uniform and not be noticed and be part of a group or you can step into a room and make a statement and look better than everybody else or you can how you feel is the way you can appear or how you want to be perceived, you use costume for those reasons. Um, in that way, the, the costume informs the themes, the story um, and the action of what happens as a result. Setting also informs the story in that it's stark, gothic, moody. It adds to the, 
kind of horror of it and the and it makes it more ironic so that you don't enter into this dark and nasty story and be completely traumatized there's irony as well there's irony between comedy and tragedy so when comedy and tragedy collide you get irony and that is a nice bridge that literary device is a nice bridge to go oh that was really sad I could cry all night or we could move on to something else but irony um amplifies the message if you will um so other literary devices I used were of course symbolism the tall buildings the backdrop for all the terrible things because it's my first novel there was lots of metaphors the hill where Tilly and Molly are looking down upon the people physically who are actually looking down upon them. Each can see exactly what the other one's doing. Um, footy oval as an eye. Was that, that I did that the day we did metaphor in writing class. All the cars around the edge with the eyelashes. Of course, juxtaposition of good and bad. The truth. Tilly and Molly with the truth. They were the good people, so were the McSwineys, the recyclers of the town, the useful people, and Irma Almanac. She was quite a nice person, but everybody else was not very nice. Um, lots of images, lots of alliteration, <laughs> sorry, um, and too much description and far too many adjectives. They were my literary devices in that wonderful first novel. But to my mind... The dressmaker and the, the crucible both asked the question, what is true and what is good? Um, the crucible, of course, presents a paradox or many paradoxes within the, the characters, their conflicts, whereas the dressmaker is just one giant metaphor, really. Um, a whole town full of people who will not change while Tilly sets out to find a better future in the end. Or, or will they change? You never know. You have to buy the sequel. Uh, in both stories, there is malice, lies, jealousy, suspicion, hysteria, isolation, lust, and many other human flaws. But in The Dressmaker and The Crucible, only the accused, um, that would be Abigail and Tilly and Molly, and to a lesser extent May and all those people, the McSwineys, only they see that for what it is, um, the human flaws and the lack of truth. Uh, and the lie, they see it. Um, in the people, in the crucible, people act according to religion and hysteria. In the dressmaker, they live according to fear and secrets. Um, Tilly's an innocent victim. Abigail is a manipulative liar, but she's also a victim, to my mind, because she was awakened to human emotions and love and lust and then abandoned quite cruelly by John Proctor. Um, and she says at one point, I see you for what you are. I know what you are, which is the way Tilly looks at her town. And the good bit is that both the, the female protagonists flee the town, taking all the money. Yes, good. Okay. So the question that Art asks, I suppose, have the people of Salem and Dungatur learned anything? Are they any better off? And I'm not going to speak any more. You can ask me questions now. Thank you for listening. That was I hope that wasn't too garbled. Right. That was extremely fascinating insight. I think that'll be very helpful for, for a lot of people's essays. Good. Uh, so I'd just like to touch on the what you said at the start about you, that being your first novel and, so, and getting published. It was quite unexpected to you. Yes. But seeing as you put so much effort in and it was so personal to, to you, did you anticipate maybe you would experience some success from the novel despite being told that your first novel doesn't usually achieve much? And did you have any inclination after writing it that it could become so successful that like a large scale film could be created about it? You know, there was, when I was writing that, in, in the writing class, there's a certain amount of competition. And so there was a few of us that stuck to that course. Um, and you know, we flexed our writerly muscles a bit. And I, we, we all were writing good novels and we all were enjoying each other's writing. But that, that of course, is a, quite a different thing to getting published. Because I remember one of the girls had written a, a book with a lighthouse in it and it was a lovely, wonderful novel. And it was rejected because they said, oh, no, we put a book out last year that had a 
lighthouse. We don't want another one of those. So uh, we still knew that it was, um, might have been a good novel. It might have been a really good novel, but whether or not a publishing house could see a way to turn it into a product that would sell because they're a business, they have to make money, uh, it's a different thing. Um, and so when it was published, I didn't actually worry that much at first because I thought it would sink without a trace. <laughs> and it didn't. Um, but the, 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 the thing about the film was um, it was optioned fairly quickly, um, but the first producer couldn't actually get it made because she wasn't all that experienced, but because the two main protagonists, one of them's the love interest, don't make it to the end, distributors didn't want to make a film that didn't have a happy ending. Um, and they didn't believe that, that, that it would, a lot of people would come and see it because um, they somehow overlooked the fact that 50% of the population are women. Anyway, we moved beyond that when a girl from my hometown, Sue Maslin, who grew up on the same lands landscape that I did and had the same bored creative existence that I did, stepped out of making a film called um, Japanese Story and said, I'll make it. And I gave it to her because I knew that she would get it uh, and I knew that she would put the story that was at the, the nucleus of the novel onto the screen. And that is what happened. And when she said to me, I've got Kate Winslet on board, I just kind of went, yeah, sure, you know. But 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 it wasn't long before I came to understand that she actually did and that she was a girl after my own heart and that when we set about to do something, we just do it. And she just did it and she kept saying, I'm going to turn this into a best, uh, you know, a blockbuster. It needs to be that kind of story. A lot of people won't get it, but I'm going to do it. And I thoroughly believed her and she did it. So good on you, Sue Maslin. And she picked the right producer, director, uh, the right director, writer, Jocelyn Morehouse. So it was all a bit of a fairy tale. And I'm happy to say that it ended like a fairy tale should happily. And how involved were you in that process of the film being made? Did you have like any creative control or did you just kind of leave it up to her? No, I, have, I know nothing about writing a screenplay, not a thing. Uh, and because she was the right producer for the project, I just handed it to her on the condition that me and my entire friends and family get to be extras and that I get to attend every red carpet event on the planet and they were the conditions and we agreed on those conditions on a golf course because we both played golf together and that is exactly what happened and so I stepped back and I didn't even I didn't look at the rushes I didn't look at anything I just went along with my friends and family to be an extra for the day uh, or a few weeks and um, then I fronted up with the at the cast and crew screening um, and that was the first time I saw it and I knew then that I'd made the right decision. And so, I, I'd, you know, not to have anything to do with it, 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 it was a wonderful thing to see because it could have been terrible, but no, it wasn't. And was all the success that came from the film and the novel itself, was that more of like a pressuring experience or was it more motivating? How did it shape the way that you approached your future writing? Well, happily, the, it's a... It, it was good because the book came out in the year 2000 and the film didn't get made till the 2015 and I'd written four more novels. So I'd found my writing voice um, and I thought that I would not have to talk about The Dressmaker for eternity. But in the meantime, The Dressmaker was put on the VCE lit list and now it's on the English list and it's just sort of keeps ticking over and it's ticked on and it's gone on and on. So now I'm resigned to happily talking about The Dressmaker for eternity. But it's been very good for my other novels because they're, although it's me and it's my own dark and nasty personality on the, on the page mostly, that I was able to kind of write different stories um, and, you know, flex my muscles in a different and develop. So... And I'm, I'm just really grateful for The Dressmaker. I, it's, 
it's been a wonderful thing. It paid my mortgage and I bought a new car. So it's good. Um, in terms of your other books, you said, obviously, The Dressmaker is based so much on your personal experiences. Uh, did that? In, did your personal experiences influence your other novels later on or did you sort of veer away from that angle? Um, I'm the kind of writer that will write from an idea. So I want to prosecute this idea when I set out with it. Uh, and then to do that, you take... And I did this in The Dressmaker. I mean, I just picked the worst aspects from the worst people I'd ever encountered and awarded them to the people of Dungatar. Um, and, I'm, you know, I travelled a lot and I kind of knew that there were similar characters all over the planet. So what, what I do now uh, is I start with my idea and then I populate my stories with characters that will carry a theme and act out what I want them to act out. So you only really need a slither of a character to build something that will, you know, to, to, to make them, create them, conjure them more and more and more to suit their, their purpose. So that's kind of basically what I do. But it's, it's a funny thing, memory, because you, you kind of realise as you're writing and you pause and search for um, some some character or something and you and I find that I've got them all tucked away in my memory and they just want to walk around with me and when I need them they tend to come to the fore and I think most writers will will say that and also we tend to carry a notebook as well but but that but the thing is that you start writing your story or your idea and then once you've done that then you you craft it so that it's better so that it's not predictable, etc. So it's a kind of process before you get to the end and what you might have started with might be completely different by the time you get to the end, completely new character. And earlier you mentioned that um, the dressmaker is now on the VC text list. How do you feel about that, particularly with it being in the comparative unit, being compared to Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible? Um, I'm pretty happy about that. I... What it does, and this is rare for authors, authors don't actually, or a lot of them don't get a lot of opportunity to talk and explain and ask questions or be asked questions. And it's a, the most valuable, wonderful thing to be able to, you know, talk about what you've done and what you've created. And so being on the lit lists and being a kind of a popular book club book a few of my books have been it, you know it's a great gift it's a wonderful opportunity I get to travel I get to go to all sorts of places and talk about myself um so that that's really valuable I'm really happy about that although it is a bit um daunting you know when you think about the content content you think oh that's a bit rude but never mind I've forgotten the rest of your question Megan what was the rest of it Oh, I was just asking how you felt about it being um, on the text list and being studied in year 12. Oh, and, you know, doing it with the Crucible. Like, yeah. That's amazing. That story, I remember that from my childhood and that's a story that you just can't forget, particularly if you're familiar with a small community, be it your, your family community or your sports club or your staff room or your urban street or your classroom um, you know, if you think about the crucible, um, you know, you could, you could imagine, if you've got a vivid imagination, how that could happen in any small community. And um, I just, I just I was enormously grateful that I was on the list with the crucible, pretty shocked and a little bit disappointed that Arthur Miller's not alive so that I could phone him up and have a beer with him <laughs> so, <laughs> let's go to Albert Park Secondary College and talk to the students together you know yeah, I mean yeah that would have been great but um mm -hmm. so with as we you mentioned like book clubs and like traveling a lot and also with it being made into a film there's been like so many different interpretations of your text were you like surprised by any of them or have you learned anything about your own book since you wrote it absolutely um I love it because especially school students that um, 
I mean, people, older people, when I do library talks, they tend to relate it to, you know, their own experience and their community and their past or their childhood or whatever. But school students, oh, my heavens, um, they come up with the best best questions and they've I think the school students have taught me the most because um, especially about the fact that when you write something and send it out into the world it kind of can be interpreted in so many ways and so many people bring their own ideas to it uh, and so people point out things to me a lot that I hadn't thought of and I'm, I'm I never cease to be amazed and I'm very grateful because it provides me something to say because I steal all their ideas and pretend they're mine and really to all the people of course which makes me look really smart so no I really I'm very happy about the whole thing I couldn't be happier. Uh, relating to those different interpretations uh, I noticed when I watched the film after reading your book multiple times that a few critical details were sort of changed mm -hmm. uh, for example I noticed when Tilly arrives back to Dungatar in the movie she has minimal recollection of her childhood yes. sort of like a trauma type thing well, this doesn't really happen in the book. And do you agree with these changes that were made? And do you think it detracted at all from the overall message you were trying to pervade? No, I was quite happy. Um, the thing about it, I twigged early on um, in discussions with Sue Maslin over golf um, that you have to fit the story into 180 minutes or less. Uh, and the distributors, the people and the people that are investing a lot of money into this um, have a belief that people won't sit in a cinema for more than 180 minutes. So, or whatever it is, I'm not sure how many minutes, but so I knew that it had to change in the form. The other thing is that it's a visual. So you look at the screen, you see the story. In a book, you read the small black dots and you make your own pictures and you have your own imagination but when you sit in a cinema and look at a screen you want a whole different experience so they have to provide you with something and, and so to do that the subtleties and the subtext would bore people to to you know walking out of the cinema so they they got on the big emotional messages the great big story so they exacerbated or enhanced the mother-daughter relationship and they turned it into a mystery so that rather than in a book as it all slowly is revealed to the reader and they piece it together, in the story, the thing that keeps the audience interested is what happened, what was the memory. And the thing I loved most about that was that a lot of the people that had seen the film, went to see the film, knew the story and they still, they, they still really enjoyed it. And that is just... That's extraordinary to me because I, I thought only the Bronte sisters or Jane Austen could write a book that we knew what was going to happen in the end and still be captivated. So, and I didn't mind that they chopped out half the characters because I, I knew they there's far too many characters for in the book, let alone on the screen. Um, but they kept the essence of the story and that was those themes that I've talked about. Um, and I... And I thought they did a wonderful job. And I'm, you know, when they, when Tilly Dunnage unfurls the red carpet at the end and sets it alight, I, I'm still recovering from that. I was so jealous when Jocelyn did that. I thought that is far better than my ending, far more dramatic. But um, of course, it's a cinema scene rather than a novel yeah. scene. So, uh, yeah, no, I find, found the whole thing entirely acceptable. And I don't think anything was lost in, in the translation. Hmm. And you mentioned like the essence of the story. So hmm. in regards to that, if like readers could take away one thing or one key message from the dressmaker, what would you want it to be? Or do you think it's fully up to like the reader? I think it's fully up to the reader because there's a lot in that book. So you could take away anything about secrets or lies or hypocrisy or bullying, but you could also talk about what is the truth and what is good and what is true. Um, and, you, you know, you think about your lack of um, introspection and, and the lies that you're living and the little fibs you tell yourself, you know, when you, you, you know the secret and you know that there's something wrong but you choose not to see. You're like everybody's, some people can sometimes see when something's going wrong and they just choose not to see or they alter the truth to make it 
palatable and give them an excuse and out. Um, because the truth kind of reduces people to what they really are, to the words that they say. So I guess if it was an over, overall arching umbrella of a thing, it would be what comes around goes around. Um, and the other thing about it was that also I wanted to point out that um, not only were the women dastardly and um, not usual, but that like it, in a small community, there, you can get stuck in a culture uh, that is peculiar to that community and it can destroy you. It, you know, it, it's best to keep an outward view, to read, to travel, to understand, to educate, to keep growing as a person rather than staying in a nice, safe enclosure and living in fear and uncertainty. So all of those things. Great. Um, so you talk about this idea of what goes around comes around sort of happening. And what I want to ask is that much of the novel seems to show that there's this idea of that Tilly might be cursed because everyone around her keeps dying. But as we figure out later, yeah, that's just a result of sort of gossiping and tox toxicity within Dungata, somewhat dispelling that idea. Yeah. What I found like enthralling sort of was the deaths of, Mr. Almanac and, Bu and Bueller's injury at the end of the novel seem to be just incredibly bad or, or good luck, depending on the way you look at it. And I was sort of wondering, is there almost a supernatural element of the Indungata or is that just luck, the way that happened? What goes around comes around. Like Mr. Almanac was a mean and nasty, horrible person and he wouldn't let his... Um, darling wife have any painkillers because you know he wanted to live a true and upright drugless life because he could see the sin around him um and the fact that he didn't take any medications himself meant that he staggered across the road and couldn't stop which is one of the idiosyncrasies of parkinson's but the Divine and lovely justice intervened in the form of Tilly Dunnage and some special cakes that she made. So really, it was it was Mr. Almanac's own fault. I mean, if he'd if he'd done the right thing and listened to science and you know upheld his role as the town chemist and enjoyed it and was truthful about it, took the things the medicines that he dispensed happily to some people then he would still be alive. And that's, and, and so that he, you know, Tilly didn't, did nothing. He did it to himself. She just tried to help. And the same with Beulah. Like Beulah, um, she's in the sequel. Beulah and Marigold feature a lot in the sequel. And she, and I had a lovely time writing her blundering, blundering around unable to see and you know a bit deaf um and being <laughs> really uh, hard to look at <laughs> so so i it's it's revenge there's something wrong with me it's just it's just me i just wanted them to suffer in the way they made tilly and molly suffer see the thing is also that's why i left them all out at fart hill because Elspeth had said, you're a bunch of hams and dullards and I never want to see you again. And, of course, at the end, she has to live with them because there's nowhere else to go. So they kind of left in that other, in their, those stupid Baroque costumes, which were highly impractical and the wrong era. Uh, and they sort of were symbolic of the Baroque period, which was very superficial in lots of ways and very pretentious. It was also very artistic and creative and witty and wonderful, but the clothes were just stupid, you know, and only the upper class could wear those ridiculous clothes. So the people of Dungatar are in their own kind of hill having to wear corsets and stupid pantaloons and silly shoes and live out there on the farm with Elspeth, and I was hoping that they might um, contemplate their fate and understand why they were in that situation, that they had done the same thing to two innocent people. So perhaps that's why they were there, but I'm not sure that that's going to happen. No.
Well, you've talked a bit about like what goes around comes around and the revenge of the end. So do you think like when you were writing the ending, did you think that it was like a just ending or like a happy ending? Or do you think it's more morally ambiguous than that? No, I think it's completely immoral. It's a terrible thing for Tilly Dunnage to do. It's a, it's an, and it's illegal. But within the context of the novel, it's entirely appropriate. And it's their culture. It's their circumstance they created it so it's justifiable and justified I think within Dungatar but I wouldn't recommend it as a um an efficient way to solve disputes mm. um just returning to the whole idea of fashion within the book I, I've noticed that the sort of sections of the novel are split into four parts in which before each of them are different fabrics named um, is there any specific meaning behind this or was it just a stylistic choice? I think they're meant to represent the texture and the tone and the mood, the fabric of, of the particular quarter of the book. But truly, honestly, they're not mine. They, the publishers put those in and the, they put them in because not long before The Dressmaker came out, there was a book called The Shipping News by Annie Prue and it was had a nautical theme and there were little knots at the start of each chapter, um, rope knots that were highly symbolic and the publishers thought that it would be a lovely idea if I had little pictures. <laughs> because, see, when a book comes out, it lands on a reviewer's desk along with 10 other books in a newspaper office or somewhere, a literary magazine. And, you know, they look at it and go, oh, another one, small town, uh, you know, 1950s. So they wanted it, they, they sent it out and it was, they, they'd covered it all in cloth, beautiful cloth, and they'd tied ribbons around it and they sent this whole package and they thought that when they looked up and saw those little things that that would be amusing and wonderful and amazing. And I don't know that if it, that particularly worked, but something worked for this book. I've got a feeling it was the cover, actually. People like the cover, so that's I can't, I can't provide you with it a whole essay on that. Sorry, because I've no idea. <laughs> no worries. All right. Well, you've mentioned that the dressmaker's sequel, the dressmaker's secret, is coming out um this year. Could you tell us a bit about that? What can we expect from it? More of the same, only worse and better. <laughs> but it it is a um. It, it, it is a progression. It is a progression for Tilly. Tilly actually does go and move on and she has a kind of um, um, vocational crisis, if you will. Um, the, the characters that accompany her through the second phase of her journey would be Sergeant Farrett, Marigold, Beulah, um, you know, and a few, few other people. But, uh, but in the end, she is forced to go back to Dungatar um, through, she doesn't want to, but she has to go back. And so I think the ending is a little bit more satisfying this time, but I'm not gonna say, I can't say anything more. You'll have to kind of wait, for, Santa Claus might bring it, you never know. Um, but yeah, it's more of, the, more of the same sort of themes to do with costume and the, pur the purpose of costume, couture, fashion, and how that can be used as a weapon as well as a language. Great. I am very excited to read it. Um, so what was it like returning to this story after close to 20 years? And have you been working on the sequel for a while or did one day you just decide, yep, it's time to revisit it? Do you know, I, um, the dressmaker, I've been sort of visiting it on and off over the years, but I hadn't actually read it. I hadn't actually sat down and, and read it. So when I started working on the sequel in earnest, I found I had to go back and read it. And that's just really annoying for all of the reasons that I've said about it being a new novel, a first, my first novel. I mean, like writers, I think there's, it's rare that you get a writer that says they're perfectly happy with the art piece of art they've created. And that was definitely the case with the dressmaker. So it's been a mixed blessing. I've enjoyed 
going back and talking about it and helping people with their studies and their understanding, but rereading it was a bit of a task. But the sequel, on and off over the, the 20 years, I, I tinkered with ideas and I knew vaguely what I was going to write about. But what had happened in those 20 years was that people had created their own sequel and students used to, I think you had, there was a question in a sack for the lit, lit people. They had to create an alternate chapter or write a scene that wasn't there. And they were amazing to me because they had P Tilly off doing all sorts of wonderful, wonderful things. And so I was a bit reluctant to disturb any of that for a while. I thought, no, I let just people make up their own minds. But um, when the film came out, and I just, I did a lot, I toured to a lot of places and did a lot of talking. And there seemed to be more people that said, where is she now than, than not. Um, and so I just kind of sat down and thought, all right, I'll finish this wretched thing. And I was quite pleased to be able to do that. Um, I took a year off work and then, of course, COVID kicked in. And so in the past six months or so, I've been working like a mad, mad woman to, to get it really polished and really finished, but I'd been plugging away at it on and off for 20 years. Great. Um, so you mentioned earlier about you had th oh, plenty of characters in your book and I don't know if that was something you were happy with, but when I was reading, I felt quite involved with community due to like the sort of the sheer depth you went into with the characters. And uh, I want to ask, how, how did you decide to write about so many people and was it difficult to keep track of them all? You know, I think um, people ask me this because there are so many characters, but I, what it gets back to is it gets back to the fact that when I woke up in Gerildery and ventured out into the township of Gerildery, not only could I see everybody's house, because it's very flat and it's, it's very dry, it's irrigation area, so there's not a lot of trees and stuff. Um, not only could I see everybody and knew exactly what they were doing, but every time I encountered someone, I encountered their entire family in my imagination. So I lived next to a, to a, to a, a family and they had nine children. Uh, everybody seemed to have either six, eight, four, children and I knew all of those kids and I knew their parents and I knew everything that happened so if something happened in the town everybody knew about it and so I think that I'm so accustomed to carrying all those people in my mind and being careful about what I said and what I didn't say in their company um, it just bled into my my first novel and now um, I find when I start to write a novel I have to consciously keep cutting out I keep inventing them and putting them in because they delight me and then the publisher will send me an email and say how's the writing going I hope you haven't got too many characters uh, and so I would cut them out but they were so vivid to me because I tend to write quite visually so I see the book and I knew them all quite well and i like them all and even after the film I've retained the original characters my Sergeant Ferret is still my Sergeant Ferret I have to say though Tilly Dunnage has turned into Kate Winslet but everybody else is pretty much who they are Hugo Weaving interferes a bit um, with my Sergeant Ferret but I I think we're all right I think it's it's okay mm. So you mentioned that you're quite like a visual writer. Could you tell us a bit more about your writing process? So you said that you write in a lot of characters and then cut them out. Like what does making a novel usually look like for you? Oh, well, you know, it changes every time because you go, right, now this time I'm going to write a synopsis. It's very detailed, but I'm going to spend a year on it and I'm going to stick to it. And then you never do because you, then you start writing it and and you you change your mind and, and characters kind of evolve and, and and things change so um for this for the for my next novel which i haven't actually started yet i'm having a bit of a break i do have a detailed synopsis and i did that 
because I didn't want to spend five years writing and rewriting, which is what I've had to do for my previous novels. I'll get a first draft down uh, and then there's too many characters and it's too long and so you cut. And every time you cut something, you have to go all the way back to the start and rewrite everything. And I didn't want to do that. So I, I have written. I went away for a week um, on my own, by myself alone, spent it in my pyjamas and wrote an entire synopsis. So that might work. But otherwise I've muddled. But the thing about I've muddled along, but the thing about writing is that you never leave until you know what's going to happen the next day. Um, and so and you get up every morning and you go up there and you write until you've got a first draft. And the way I work is that if I've got a first draft, then I've got something that I can craft um, and so I'm hoping that works with the synopsis too. So I've got a synopsis that I can fill it in and do all the descriptions. It may or may not work. And the old way was um, making it up as I went along and then going back and changing it every wretched six months or so. So they are the two processes. But also um, I tend to write the action, what I see and what the characters do, and then I tend to go back and colour it in. A bit and sometimes you get a bit carried away with your descriptions and you'll get it back from the editor with a line down the side after you spent hours writing a beautiful scene like there was one I wrote for Summer at Mount Hope and it was it was highly symbolic my main protagonist Phoebe walked to the top of a hill and looked out over the bay and the clouds parted and the sun shone down and lit the water and she had a revelation at the time and I spent days writing this wonderful piece fleshing out what I thought and then when that came back from the publisher my editor had drawn a line down the side of the paragraph and written it's just a cloud devastating <laughs> so you know, so it's a it's a process. It's, it's all I can say is that it's try it out, chuck it out, try it out, chuck it out, nailed it kind of thing. You know. Um, I think you've pretty much answered everything we have to ask. You've been great to have. Thank you so much for coming. And Pleasure. yep, everybody buy the dressmaker's secret. Yes, for Christmas. Thank exactly. you so much. I've enjoyed it immensely. You have excellent questions. and It was an absolute joy. And I wish you all the very, very best in whatever it is you choose to do with your lives. <laughs>